Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to Divine Masculine Mondays. John Tran, welcome. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Hey, it's great. And it is great. I'm. It's great because not only do all three of us have in-ear monitors, like true rock stars, but uh, we have a special guest that I've been looking forward to for weeks, especially because I thought we were going to have him on last week. Um, and uh, this guy is, um, he is an inspirational dude. We found each other through the algorithms of the universe, and um, he's really inspired me. And uh, his name is Chef Lamb, but he's not just a chef. Um, chef Adam is a professional chef with 30 years of successes and failures, which he's leveraged and used as the producer and host of Chef Life Radio, which I got to uh, be a guest on, which empowers culinary professionals to break free of the grind mindset. But also he's a consultant, coach, and mentor, uh, speaking on the issues of mental health and wellness, addiction, culture and building community um there's so much more about him but we're gonna actually talk about to him and uh you know adam has led men's work men's circles uh, men's initiation has been through it and is one of the most honest dudes leading this work that i know so uh adam lamb welcome it's very kind of you ben yeah, I, I kind of uh, found it to be fascinating the way we kind of found one another. You know, I don't, I'm not going to give it to the algorithm, but I'm going to say it was uh, somehow divinely orchestrated that you kind of reached out to me and we started a dialogue. And then, um, and the more we discovered about one another, the more we're like, yeah, we got to, we got to do something. So uh, it was great to have you on the podcast, just kind of grinding away through the, uh, through the editing of that, because now it's instead of just kind of, very lightly edited interviews it's more of an, uh, a narrative uh, story um, and you've got a really compelling story so i thought that was really brilliant that uh, that you were so vulnerable and transparent in our conversation hmm. um, it just spurred more in me so when you say that it, i inspired you i think it's you know mutual admiration society not, not to leave john out because john's pretty inspiring in himself yeah. so <laughs> well, that was the other Thanks. reason I was excited that I wanted to say is to bring you all together with like the uh, the yin to my yang, uh, Mr. John <laughs> Trad send in the house. Hi, John. Hey, Ben. Hey, Adam. Man, so hey, good man. to have you guys. And just to be with you all on a Monday yeah. discussing really amazing topics. So I'm ready to dive in. I can tell you've got a good haircut, too. Thanks. Thanks. You too, Adam. <laughs> um, a lot less labor intensive that's right so we have some men here and women and and people however you identify i want to encourage you to be part of the conversation and join in and ask questions uh, you can definitely type them in and we'd love to talk about it um uh adam uh one thing i love to do is ask guests what what they're interested in talking about and adam brought some really great issues up that um i see a lot of different men working with and i just want to throw some things out and see what lands um and one of the things were uh you know i sort of titled this asking for help i saw a lot of things around communication that you're sharing adam and and inside of those it was like how men wear pain is a badge of honor like our pain and suffering, like we have to, um, how to actually communicate. And the other thing was the power of, of initiation and uh, that it's not too late for men to be initiated and have initiation and, and men's circles and eldership and connection in their lives. And so those are all things that we've talked about here and uh, I think we're all kind of aligned on. So I would just love to unpack some of that and see you know, what had you, what are, what are the things that, you know, some, some men, you know, may not even know what initiation is. I feel like right. women maybe know that a lot more here because there's rites of passage for women and women's circles. And, um, but I feel like men really are still disconnected from that. And so I wonder if you could talk a little about, about initiation. And I know both of you have experiences with, with some of the sacred work. So I'd love to hear, um, you know, maybe you, Adam, could define what initiation uh, is to you and sure. what you think the role of it is, you know, why, why we should be talking about it. 
Well, I think uh, the place to start would be uh, my experience with uh, faux initiation or, mm. you know, um, growing up, you know, I often use the phrase train shamed and conditioned to, to be a certain type of man or at least encouraged. Uh, my dad wasn't really, wasn't the type of person to, you know, beat it into me about what kind of man I should be, but still my exploration of that is there's messages that I picked up as a young child and young man that were both explicit and implicit by the way he was acting, by the way my mom was acting. <clears throat> and, um, you know, one of the things is that he always sent us to Sunday school, but he never mm -hmm. came to church. So my mother would take us mm -hmm. and it would take us around to, my mother would take us to different types of churches. And I once asked him, well, you know, well, why don't you come with us? And he says, well, because I don't believe in God. And I'm like, well, what do you think happens when we die? And then he launched into this, he said, well, what I believe happens to me when I die is, you know, one night I just go to sleep and, and, uh, and I don't wake up and they put me in the ground and the worms eat me. And, you know, that seems like a pretty reasonable explanation, but to a 14 year old, it's kind of shocking. And I remember laying in bed that night, um, physically shaking with the fear that holy shit man i'm just going to go to sleep and i'm never going to wake up again so i guess that's kind of the start of my seeking and um i had been in different organizations going through high school i was you know class president i was on the wrestling team uh, each one of those organizations have their own type of hazing or or initiation yeah. but very very rarely do they call it a rite of passage but in yeah. fact that's what yeah. it is and uh, I remember wrestling being kind of brutal. <laughs> yeah, I but, wrestled uh, too one, at an all boys school, so I know exactly what. Yeah, you're where they hold you down and do the cherry belly on you, and and um, as as a starter, and it feels really great when it's over, but it's terrifying to go through. Um, and um, some take it better than others. Uh, some are actually broken by that and turn away. Um, I had a kind of stubbornness that I was always going to kind of survive whatever circumstance I was going through I was in the military again kind of had that faux um, initiation but it wasn't until I was actually doing men's work that I understood what a rite of passage was and believe it or not it was kind of like Star Wars the movie Star Wars that kind of it there was something about it that I couldn't quite put my finger on it until I started looking at Joseph Campbell's work and um, the hero's journey and how that goes across cultures and time as uh, as an iconic an iconic journey for young men to go through in one way, shape, or form. And then when I started looking back at all the ways that I had gone through those faux initiations, I realized that it was almost every decade that I was presented with a new set of problems or a new situation in which I went through another sort of initiation. So I guess I, I don't. I'm clear that it's not something that happens once and, and we're all good um, because as, as human beings and as men, particularly, we continue to evolve, albeit sometimes much slower than women, because I think women or the, or the feminine is so much more apt to say, hey, listen, I, I need some help. Um, who, who can help me? Whereas, uh, again, I was particularly trained, changed and conditioned that, you know, it's up to me to wrestle the problem to the ground in my own mind and come up with a solution and then communicate that. So it wasn't, um, and, and I don't think, I don't think that's the way to do it. I don't think the feminine, and please forgive me because I don't want to make generalizations here, but generally speaking, in the work that I've done, men and women, or the masculine and feminine, communicate very differently, um, and both are trying to reach some sort of understanding. And one can be very verbal, and the other one can be very silent. And neither one of those are very, uh, in of themselves, can be very productive unless there's kind of a Kind of a sweet middle ground found um and that just comes from being willing to let love win in any particular situation mm -hmm. so this whole idea of of ritual that happened for thousands of years um in cultures all across the world all of a sudden disappeared during the um during the industrial revolution when fathers were aggregated you know labor was aggregated to towns and all of a sudden fathers are no longer on the farms around the town and boys are walking around going, hey, what's going on here? And so um, I, I don't know why we as modern peoples think that, you know, something that worked for 
thousands of years all of a sudden is now expendable when in fact hmm. in the culinary industry for 35 years a lot of a lot of behavior i saw was just uninitiated behavior and i would be the first one to to admit that i um was you know right up there with them you know whether it's drinking or drugs or chasing skirt or whatever those are all uninitiated behaviors because as you become initiated into adulthood or elderhood you realize that there are things that are much more important than just the momentary pleasures of life not to say that that we need to renounce those completely but that once you start serving a purpose bigger than yourself then those things kind of pale in significance at least you said a lot of beautiful powerful things there um john do you want to comment you're muted i was just curious do you do you feel that uh, some of the initiations like the wrestling or the hazing is that is that something that still serves a purpose in uh in 2021 no no I, I, so to take a step back, um, I believe that things should be hard. They don't necessarily need to be harsh. Traditionally, right of initiation um, had some type of pain element involved, whether that was jumping off a tower with a, with a rope made of vine around your ankle so that your forehead just touched the ground, or there was some type of piercing or not dangerous pain but enough pain to realize that this is something to be overcome mm -hmm. i don't necessarily know what the modern equivalent of that is but i also understand that as we grow older and whether it's a career or something else as we start to gain quote unquote secret knowledge that there needs to be a there should be some type of payment to in order to gain that knowledge whether it's being in service to that particular institution for a long time or something along those lines Does that make any sense to you john totally makes sense and i'm curious if if there's a way to teach initiation without uh, including the harshness and the pain and I, mm -hmm. I feel like uh humans resonate better when they're led by from the heart rather sure. than uh, than redirected through fear so yeah, I, I can think, i think some of those initiations were just like well, I'll, I'll show you something to be scared about. You know, it's like, it's that, that, Absolutely. let me give toxic, you toxic yeah. fear yeah. to guide right. you, to guide you somewhere else rather than like, um, let's find out what you're passionate about and let's initiate you with lots of love and encouragement into this sure. you know, fear mm -hmm. of, of reality that you're creating. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it could be seen in both sides, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because growing up, I was in high school marching band and Man, I was ninth grade freshman. I was put in a drum box for like a the bass drum box, and they rolled me down a hill wow. inside of a box of a bass drum, and uh, it was harsh. And that didn't teach me anything about loving my craft and uh, right. and being up to the challenge of like marching in a band in front of a hundred people, a thousand people even. So uh, there's, I feel like there's different ways to teach uh, you to be strong and powerful and the leader. Absolutely. I Rather than humiliation. <laughs> so, so let me kind of describe to you. So I'm part of an organization here in uh, Asheville called Journeyman. And the reason the organization exists is to do uh, group mentoring for young boys and young men. And twice a year, um, we take them on an adventure up to a mountain, not too far from here. As a matter of fact, it just happened last weekend uh, that we call Ropa or, or um, which is a rites of initiation weekend um, that is, involves sacred theater. So typically there are 60 mm. men who come together with for 12 to 14 boys. Now at the very beginning of the of the experience, these boys come are you know come into a parking lot. There's a cord cutting ceremony with their parents, and then they're led down this path. And typically I work the the shack that they first come to. Now along the path there are people are men dressed up in sacred uh, iconic figures who are if not jeering them asking them questions like you can do this no you can't do this you can do this you can do basically voicing a lot of the angst that they must be feeling already 
right? And they come to this little um, shack and I, I didn't get to do it this year, but in previous years, like I say, okay, let me see all your belongings because previous to that, they don't know why they're there for the weekends. They've been told all kinds of things, fishing. And so they've got all this gear with them and we basically take it all away from them at which it already starts to freak them out because maybe there's uh, particular clothes or jewelry or stuff that's part of their identity that they're emulating right now. And we take all that away and they give them uh, you know, a pair of uh, black sweatshirt and black uh, sweats uh, and a sleeping bag and a towel and a toothbrush. And like, that's all you're gonna need for this weekend. And then they're led from that area to a field in which they're separated. So they can't congregate and, and like shuck and jive or, or bullshit with one another, but they're separated, sat down in this field and they're asked to contemplate like who they are, what identity are they, are they actually uh, living in right now? And that happens until sunset. And then right around sunset, they can hear the drums through the trees. Like they have no idea what's happening. So there's, so they're off kilter. They're kind of out of their safe space um, from their personality standpoint. And some of them are very, very nervous. Um, and then at some point they're led up into this clearing around a huge bonfire where there's 60 men all pounding drums in service to these boys. And there's an inner circle in which they sit. And then the ceremony starts from there. And that goes over the course of an entire weekend. So I think sometimes it's important to be um, either asked or, or cajoled or shocked to be out of our comfort zone in order for there, for there to be space for us to consider something else that might be available. Um, because I know for me at times in my life, I was so, I was so strongly identified with being a chef that I thought that's who I was. And it was only till I had some pretty significant uh, experiences and got to be frank, my ass kicked a little bit, brought me off my pedestal. And that happened through things that I had did or I had done and that being reflected back from others. And it's also things that kind of happened as part of business, but either way, I was kind of left uh, to really think about who I was and who I wanted to become as a way of being, instead of just kind of being locked into this thing about, you know, this is who I am. This is how I conduct myself. Because I got to tell you, you know, there's a certain way of being for a chef when they're at work and I would come home and I would still kind of be in that mode. And my wife would look at me say, you know, I don't work for you. <laughs> I might be asking for a cup of tea or whatever, but because it's still carrying on and there's no pattern interrupt, in the middle of that identity, it's for me, it was very easy to kind of bring it home. And so uh, working on certain ritual for me between work and home was really important. Once I started realizing that uh, all I was doing was creating distance between myself and the people that I love the most. Hmm. What, what's a ritual that you do to, to, to switch that mode? Um, one is I blessed here in Asheville to have the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, which yeah. is, you know, kind of goes across mountaintops in, in several states. And there's a section that I get to drive and you can only drive 35 miles an hour. And there's usually gawkers and people looking at the, at the, at the colors of the leaves or, or people riding mo uh, bicycles or hiking. So it's very important to be present when you're driving that. So when I'm kind of in my, my doing thing, um, I'll drive that and it just gives me an opportunity to wind way, way, way down and just consider again, the beauty and the place in which we live and how fortunate we are to be here. And typically that's something that kind of brings me right back into my body. I love the talk about the, the tools and nature and switching gears. And, um, John, these are great questions too, that you're asking. Um, ah, thank something you. I wanted to jump back to and, but it's, it's related still, and that's inside of initiation and us talking about that. Because I grew up in the South, and it's the, the older I get, the more I do this work, the more I see all, like, just the veil slowly lifting, you know? It's like you're, you're a teenager, and you think you know everything, and then you get in your 20s, and then you really think you know everything, and then you get in your 30s, and just every, t you know, keep getting older, and you're like, I didn't know shit. That's, like, the biggest lesson you <laughs> learn, right? Right. <laughs> But the, these initiations we had at my school were like seventh graders. The new kids were called pygmies. And when they'd come into chapel in the mornings, everyone would go, wee. And it was like the little kids coming in. 
and we'd put them in pygmy traps. I'd say we, because this is what I was taught and happened to me, like right. getting shoved behind a door and, you know, 30 pound backpacks thrown over or like really intense, like a violent, aggressive stuff that people are laughing at. And it's like, oh, it's okay. But, um, and even seeing myself disgusted by it and watching myself participate in it, it was almost like an out of body experience. Like I got sucked into it and yet it um i've gotten to make amends for that behavior uh, specifically but it i could see how much it was just part of the culture and it's still what our high school is dealing with today is undoing that still from being a military mm -hmm. school a long time ago where we had this corporal punishment initiation that we have to go through pain we have to suffer you know and you guys made this really beautiful distinction about you know pain versus suffering or or inflicting you know unnecessary pain and what I was still thinking about the beautiful rites of passage is so good that you're talking about every man. Um, I was doing some research on it it's on Instagram as well. And um, they, you know, to, to have these rites of passage that we didn't, we didn't have growing up and um, to have these positive ways to, to create that. And there are still journeys you can go on people who lead um, some really beautiful vision quests and, sacred quests because what i'm also looking at now is so for us men who as boys never had that healthy journey that healthy initiation um you know how do we create that as men because we need it you know and men are men are crumbling now to their knees for help because we realize we can't continue in this world much longer the way we're going right and it's we can't hide from the truth much longer and so I, I'm always seeking, how can we create more healthy initiation for men of our age, right? And I, so so to bring it full back, that's why I, I also forget though, well, one way we can do it is men of our age can go lead younger men, you know, yeah. and we can get be of service that way because we're gonna learn so much from them and we don't have to reinvent the will. We can just go be of service to the next, the future leaders that are gonna be here when we're gone. So I just want to acknowledge you for that work that you're doing and say like, you know, how can we do this? How can we undo this stuff? What were you going to say, John? Oh, I, I was going to say, how cool would it be if every fraternity in, in, on the planet, instead of hazing, they actually did like a sacred sons or mankind project mm. weekender where they get to strip that, toxic masculinity and really step in and learn some some divine tools yeah. that can lead them um you know in, in the right direction rather than to to recycle old old habits or old uh, yeah. paradigms and that sacred bond that's that would actually bond. allow you to connect on a positive way because we come back for these reunions and we wonder why we don't want to go to our high school reunions it's fucking horrible in high school it's so messed up you know, so toxic. And, you know, we're all supposed to pretend like, oh, that didn't happen. And, and we're, you know, walking around. But the only way I see sometimes the, to bond is to go back to that familiar behavior that didn't serve us. Yeah. Right? And that's how we get to live through that still through the football culture, the military culture, the, the chef culture, the any culture, you know, inside of hierarchies where there it's important to have discipline and dominance and a chain and but what i really see inside of that is there's clear the healthy masculine in that is the is the clear boundaries the clear communication right and then the feminine is how to communicate with you know you come home and not to bark at your partner and uh and not to continue this but we we need we need more spaces to to have these conversations so i'm just grateful to be inside of this today with you guys yeah. i think your point about being in service to others is really powerful um and i can tell you the first time i was actually drawn to journeyman i, I, I said think i had man, didn't i i meant journeyman. yeah but that's okay yeah thank you for um, the correction that's okay uh Good journeyman a journeyman yeah uh Lost him on here too i'm not quite sure what my idea was of, of what was going to go on um, but I made a really strong connection with the director, um, and he ended up putting me, uh, in two middle schools. 
So there was part part of the program is um, to have this mentoring group in middle schools, uh, and I was doing two of them. So it would be one Thursday morning, one Friday morning, and it basically spends the entire school year. And the weird thing was, is it started out as kind of like the cl- the uh, the club to send uh, the bad boys to. And that wasn't really in service to the people who came just because they wanted that they were actually yearning for that type of connection. And slowly but surely we were able to kind of turn that around. And so typically there's a group of 12 to 15 boys um, and it's, you know, pretty raucous. I mean, it's middle school for crying out loud. It's that awkward time that everybody hates because you're not quite, you know, you're no longer a child, but you're not quite in your uh, in your space where you feel really comfortable. So everybody's got this constant angst going on, but I found it to be really, really, really powerful for me as an individual to be in service. And it, you know, it's 45 minutes. It's really hard to get into a deep conversation with these guys in 45 minutes, but that's why it would take three of us and we would triangulate the group and it got to be where it was working really, really well. But I was clearly, uh, I was very present to the fact that as I was walking out, I was as fulfilled as, as anybody in the room could have been because I was seeing a different perspective of not only what was going on, like we asked, what well, what was their biggest fear in school? And of everything that was going on, I think we could have come up with six or seven different things. And the, mm-hmm. without question, the first thing they came up was uh, school shootings. Mm. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, it's something that we see in the papers and the news and we don't really give it much thought, but these kids are actually swimming in that ocean. And so they're they have to petrified for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So that fear um, and, re- you know, tied in with that readiness is probably important, but you know, the rest of it is just really, really, it seemed to me that they were carrying much a much heavier weight than than they really should to be in middle school. I, and I don't remember any of that kind of crap when I was in middle school. And it was it was hard enough just to survive, just to get through a day without you know uh, getting jumped in the locker room or you know or it, stump, stupid shit like that. And so, in many ways, what the the, cho- uh, the young men of today are going through is much more complicated. I couldn't imagine what it's like to grow up with the internet and porn so readily available that scares the shit out of me and i have a grandson who's you know about seven years old and you know there was a guy in our group who statistic you know the national statistic is you know children are introduced to porn as early as nine and almost always it's because it's on one of their parents' phones or tablets and um because there's no because they don't have the the analytical mind quite built uh, and filtered. Um, there's a shorter path between input and um, input and release. So they become, you know, very easily addicted to these things to the point where there's actually a clinical term now for this type of ED that these boys are experiencing because it's all digital. And then they get with a girl who's live and real and they can't get it up. So what is the, the oh, oh, erectile, dysfunction. erectile dysfunction, Yeah, you know, so imagine yourself as a 17 year old who can't get it up with a real live girl, because most of the time it's to this digital, uh, oh monster. The AI and is getting so even stronger and more powerful yeah. and interactive. And yeah. It's so it be, so being with the young men has really kind of hit me to a lot of the struggles that they're going through. Um, and it also sensitizes me to, uh, what they're going through because as a man, sometimes it's a lot it's been easier to kind of stand back and watch somebody struggle as opposed to try to help. And that's one of the things that we're really working uh, hard at in the hospitality industry around health and wellness is, you know, to have um, interactions and not transactions and to be able to just be in conversation with people and ask, you know, when's the last time you felt like you hurt you wanted to hurt yourself or when's the last time you felt suicidal, not as a way of confronting them, but as a, a, a doorway through which they know that they can have a conversation whether they choose to or not. And if not, you know, here's, here's the, here's the national number that you need to text. Here's what you need to do. Someone will call you back within five minutes. It doesn't have yeah. to be us, yeah. but it's like most, I grew up fearing other men 
right? Because they wanted what I had, you know, from the aspect of, you know, they're going to take my woman, they're going to take my cave, they're going to take my meat that's hanging there. And so I have to keep all men separate from me. And then once that, once that lie got burned up and I realized that there were other men that were suffering just like me, and we could actually be in a circle and talk and hear each other with, with a heart of love. Every time I have a circle in my house, my wife loves it because she says the energy of the house just changes. <laughs> so there are, there are ways, many more ways now uh, for men to be with other men than there traditionally has been um, in a loving and caring environment. And, you know, there's all kinds of things like sweat lodges. I mean, I know because of COVID, those things have been kind of off the table, but as we start to progress into uh, better health from a country standpoint, an individual standpoint, you know, these things are going to come back because people need it. I mean, there's a place I go to here in Asheville that's a great place called Sauna House, and it's a communal sauna. And my wife and I go in there and we hang out with a bunch of younger people and I come out completely energized. It's not a sweat lodge, but it's kind of like that same thing. So there's some, as long as there's kind of ritual and a clear intention about why you're entering into a particular experience, I think anything like that can be very, very powerful. Not to mention that there are, you know, certain organizations and places now where you can do plant medicine safely and securely. Uh, I wouldn't want to be one to advocate everybody do that, but for a certain segment, I think that that's a powerful thing. It was powerful for me and, um, and kind of led me down deeper the wormhole about again, who I was and who I came here to be and how I can become the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. I know that was a lot, man. (laughs) Amen. I, oh man, I resonate with that so much, Adam, Uh, especially the plant medicine part. That's what uh, cracked me open. And to see, I was living life through just everything that my, my dad taught me was like, this is right and this is wrong and this is how it's supposed to be. And, just a little bit of plant medicine allowed me to remove his veil a little, like keep his veil halfway, open mind the other half so I can mm-hmm. see my perspective and uh, trust my own truth. And Perfectly what, said. what a journey. Wow. So yeah, totally resonate with that. Yeah. That's and and like I said, I, I would, I just want to say that there are some people that it's not, you know, it's not okay for, you know, folks who have some, um, you know, who have some mental illness that has been diagnosed and they've been taken medic. Folks have to be very, very careful when it yeah. comes to, yeah. to augmenting their reality with plant medicine. And it's not a panacea for everybody. My wife did it and she basically came out of it going, okay, so what's the big deal? Because for my wife, she knows that each of us as individuals and human beings already have the capacity to be able to access the divine anytime we want. But as a man, I never knew what that looked like or what it meant like or what that experience felt like. So to be able to do plant medicine that one time in this kind of really beautifully crafted cocoon of care. Yeah. Now I know what that feels like. I can I can go there anytime I want to. But I didn't have any previous context for what she was saying, you know, so and which is funny because the the time I went. It was 70 percent men. So there's something about that particular style plant medicine that speaks to men because you know it's very direct what did right? you what did you do adam what was it i, I did uh, i did ayahuasca and at a place called rhythmia in costa rica so you basically it's a seven day it's a resort set up you go there for seven days you do plant medicine uh four times there's uh there's health intake there's all kind of, it's all organic food i don't mean to be a, a psa for them but but Jerry's really got it figured out very, very well. Hmm. Um, and I'm just really, I want to be very cautious about folks who, you know, are going to go to the middle of the jungle in Thailand and do ayahuasca because ayahuasca is very, uh, like I said, she's very straightforward. You know, there's no mucking around with her. Yeah. She will. And if you go in with any intention, that's not clear. She's going to suss that out and pull your drawers down. Like, okay, now what? And so to be able to have that um, education and the preparedness that the, the way that they do at this particular resort, yeah. I found to be really, really powerful. You know, I knew what to expect. It's not like I was trying to figure everything out, but I came to the medicine in complete surrender. I said, this is my intention. And she showed me everything, dude. She showed me everything, mm-hmm. including, including 
you know, my soul, who I even wrote a book about it, but, uh, you know, I, it was all for me, my experience, it was all cinematic. So it's like, I'm sitting in a movie theater watching this thing happen on the stage. And my ego is sitting upstairs, you know, uh, five rows above me, drunk off his ass, talking throughout the entire movie. And I'm like, dude, we just... <laughs> so there was kind of... It was very I'm meta. Challenge you. I'm going to challenge Go you ahead. on something, Adam. Uh, when you said it, it might not be for everyone, uh, maybe, you know, the people that uh, are on medication and that, you know, I'm going to challenge you. And I feel like, well, just to rewind, Ben and okay. I have a fellow brother that his name is Alejandro. He's a coach. And he coaches people on psychedelics uh, and microdosing. And he posted on his timeline yesterday that Newsweek magazine, they showed like this Prozac and it was like from the 80s. Uh -huh. And it was like the miracle drug. And it, his, his little meme that he puts was then and now. And then the, the latest Newsweek has mushrooms. And it says um, psychedelics have shown to help depression. But in the, in the old 1980s, magazine cover it was like prozac the new answer to depression so it's just <laughs> like uh, this night and day contract but it's just sure. like but i think the people that have been on the medication um if they're even thinking about ayahuasca maybe it's not working and maybe it's time to like to take a one week two week dieta off of the meds and then mm -hmm. try mother nature's Truth and they, <laughs> right and 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 uh rhythmia does have a protocol for that stuff yeah I, all, all i'm trying to say is that you know there are some folks okay so i'm a big and i'd like to big, speak to this from experience yeah. as well I, i'm a i'm a big fan of uh of joe dispenza and his meditation work and i was at a four-day event not too long ago and a guy got it because he brought up all his um researchers and scientists because he does a lot of data collecting during this mess and there was a psychologist who got up and recounted this story about this uh, patient of his that he brought to a four day event. And um, because the patient was able to access uh, a certain part of his memory that had been locked away, he went into this very, very agitated state that took him a while to, to get him back grounded. And the way the, the, way the, the, way the researcher described it. She said, before the age of seven, all children are in beta. They're in constant beta. So it's dreamland all the time. Right about seven. Now all of a sudden their prefrontal cortex gets a little bit more complicated. And now they start getting analytical and it's almost two halves of the same memory. So anything that happens prior to them, seven of traumatic event or whatever can get locked in that. It's not even the subconscious. It's the deep, 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 deep con that they're, that they can't even access. And later in life, can somehow show show up as a psychosis with no previously known trigger. You know what I'm saying? So all I'm saying, uh, all I would say is, yeah, I am completely down for it, but everybody needs to be responsible to themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? sure. <laughs> and mushrooms are way different than doing ayahuasca, as in San yeah. Pedro. San Pedro is so lovely and soft and kind of beguiling but you know ayahuasca is like hitting your head you know hitting you over the head with a with a hammer and you know for men like me that's <laughs> that worked because <laughs> sometimes yeah. that's what it takes yeah. but i'm sorry ben you were gonna say no this is a really beautiful important discussion in my eyes i'm so glad we're having it and um yeah i just want to speak from someone who has been diagnosed with ptsd anxiety depression um, works with a lot of bipolar clients and people who, who are on medication and that works and hasn't worked. And I've been on and off medication, actually got off it through sobriety and, and prayer and meditation and mm -hmm. exercise and therapy and all of the things um, and tried plant medicine. And it was borderline traumatic for me and healing. Uh, cause I did, I did ayahuasca and I journeyed with her and I asked for a big intention and, um, I did it with really, really sick in a sacred, sacred space with, with shamans who I really trust, who are very experienced. And so I just want to say, um, how much to, I want to talk about the, the importance of safety and, and listening to your own body and getting, doing it with experienced professionals and guides, uh, with intention. Um, 
And even these same shamans have, have actually, you know, helped me understand that it's not appropriate for me right now because I've started taking medication again a year ago and that's working. And honestly, I am not at it. And it can take up to three months to come off of an antidepressant uh, safely, anything like that, that could interrupt with those. So, so, psycholo- so physiologically, chemically, there are very important things to look at if you're on medication. It's not just like a drop it for a week and come back on. Like dropping it can have really serious consequences on the brain as well. So just the importance of integration. And, um, and, and I hear a lot of experience on this call with both sides of this. So I think that's why it's so important that we're having it, this conversation today. Um, we lost one side of it, but I'm sure John will be back. We still have him on Instagram here. I know, it's weird. Huh? Uh, uh, here he is. Yeah. So, um, and I've seen it be the thing that, that have helped people who, who, you know, there's no one as we used to, as, as there's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's no right way to get sober. And yet there can be a very dominant toxic male energy, masculine energy of there. Well, this is the way, you know, but I've sponsored guys and I know people have sponsored guys that, that have, you know, been had cannabis involved or had plant medicine involved in their recovery. And, you know, point being no matter, and that's one, I mentioned that organization because it's one of the most powerful, effective organizations in the world and it's built on service. But the other thing is that it's built on autonomy and there's no, like every person has to listen to their self. And the other thing it's built on is the importance of asking for help and seeking help and connection. And so one thing I'm seeing inside of all of this that we're talking about is how to ask for help you know when when we need when it's time to <laughs> accept a shift and accept medicine whether it be love plants uh you know science whatever whatever it is because we're working with fungi all the time whether we know it or not right <laughs> we're working with plants all the time and and even going outside can be an amazing plant medicine right mm-hmm. just being in nature and the importance of sweat lodges now and you can do that with or without um you know external internal forces um but the the other thing you mentioned is is just you know you said suicide hotlines you said uh you know john talked about the gatherings he's done he's going to live in a environment next week he's moving to tulum to support him in embracing nature and creating more healing for people all over the world. Wow. And John, you've created this beautiful podcast inside of one of the most, you know, we have men still have the highest rate of suicide chefs being number three on there. Right. Yeah. And this amount of masculinity in there that we're all dealing with despite gender. And, uh, I don't really know where I was going with all that, but I felt very inspired by, by you guys inside of this. Yeah. I mean, the, I heard you, so two things that really landed with me, Ben, is um, is integration mm. um, and asking for help. Mm-hmm. So John, maybe you can speak to this. Um, so doing the medicine is one thing, um, and then coming home, I found <laughs> something very, very different, right? And so that time of integration of that experience I mean, the re- the reason the reason I read wrote the book was it was my way of kind of integrating that that experience. Yeah. Um, You'd be like, I try to make light. sense. And your wife's like, that's great. Like, what are we going to do about our marriage? <laughs> <laughs> the one the one thing was is part of the instruction uh, during that week was okay. Uh, I want you to write this down, and I want you to call somebody you love, hmm. and I want you to tell them that at some point you will call them in a panic, saying that either you all made up. You, you made it all up or it was all bullshit or you're freaking out or da, 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 da. he said and so we all broke i went and called my wife i said he's saying that i am going to call you at some point and say this well on the flight home because you, you you come from this cradled environment and then you're at the airport and that is such a shock to the system to begin with uh because there's all these american tourists who are like beat red and 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 sunburnt, you know, trying to grab the last tchotchke off the wall before they get on their flight. By the time I got to Miami, I was gibbering and called my wife. I'm like, it's all bullshit. And she said, just take a deep breath. You told me you're going to do this. So John, do you want to talk 
about like the importance of integration and what that experience was like for you? You're muted, John. Uh, I did ayahuasca twice and the second time we were able to do integration, but the first time it was just kind of um, sit in a circle, talk, and then everyone goes home. But um, the second time I did it in, in Mexico, um, we got to journal, we got to talk, um, and it was, it was really figuring out how to, to take what you learned and take it home and how you can uh, just put put it all in, into place. So um, mm. integration is huge. And intention is the most important part of, of plant medicine. If there's no intention, then it's just basically you're taking drugs. So intention's number one, and then the journey, that safe container. But the, the integration is, uh, without it, like, it's almost, it's not almost pointless because it just brings attention to the, the right. after part. So, um, yeah, I I resonate with that, and I I feel like we can uh, definitely learn from each other and, and learn from mm -hmm. what integration methods sure. work best. So I think moving forward, I feel like there's going to be more of us facilitating containers where we're not maybe not with plant medicine, but just with with men in general. And how do we integrate what we learn in circle or what we learn in ritual together? Right. And how do we take that back home? How do we turn the switch off so that we're not barking at our, our loved ones? And, um, and how can we work together? Because I think sometimes when us men doing the work, it's like a bubble that we're in. We're kind of in this <laughs> perfect bubble. And when we get out into the real world, are we really integrating it into strangers that we meet? Um, when we see elders, when we when we're in working partnerships with the feminine, how are we actually practicing this? Like this is the this is the scrimmage, and the real world is the Super Bowl. And are we are we, are we really putting it to good use in the Super Bowl? Man, that that lands with me so much. I, that's very strong. Um, yeah, because you know you might only be. I, Speaking for myself, I might only be in circle once every three weeks. And then, and then what do I do the rest of the time? You know, how am I keeping yeah. that alive? How am I, um, for lack of a better word, keeping my, keeping my spear sharp, hmm. right? So it's like, uh, yeah, there's so much to learn from one another. And I think taking it into our world is so important because how else is any other man going to get the message that it's safe to do that? Hmm. Amen. <laughs> you know, I just, I love talking about this too, because my wife and I both do this work and, uh, this work, meaning we work on ourselves. We're both in therapy. We both, uh, have a daily strive to have a daily meditation practice and journaling and, um, having, you know, her, she meets with women and I, I have time with men and time alone and together. Um, so we work really hard at relationships and helping nurture healthy relationships for other people. And because neither of us really had, um, neither of us really had that example growing up. You know, I remember even my parents saying, you know, I would ask them for advice and they were like, well, I don't know, you guys are already doing better than us. Like, I don't know what to tell you, you know? Uh, we just, because we didn't have the communication. And so that's, that's either way, it's it's so I think the practice is just what's important and also not to use all of this stuff we're talking about like if this is foreign or you don't know how to do it or you're not doing it well I'm just sharing this like my wife and I we still go at each other regularly because we're still imperfect we're still human trying to learn this and work it out and still don't always catch our like our inner childs or our our attachment complexes, you know, until it's, we're kind of in it sometimes. And so it's just, what I want to say is compassion and a reminder to have compassion. And especially no matter what your gender is, if you've been taught that toxic masculine way of beating yourself up as a way of, of pep talking yourself or pushing through just to, to use all this with like a feather, you know, as a friend used to say, put down the bat and pick up a feather. And, uh, 
and look where you can bring compassion into your life and even using these tools and, and your relationships, like have compassion. Like this is going to take practice. It's going to be ugly sometimes. Right. And can you say to your partner, uh, you know, I love the hope open O thing that's been really spreading thanks to Tony Robbins, but the Hawaiian saying, I, I love you. Um, please forgive me. Thank you. And, uh, it's just a way to say like, I'm a work in progress. Thank you. You know, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient as on my journey with me to your partner or whoever you're working with. Cause then you can take responsibility that way and continue to look. My partner and I do have an agreement where say, Hey, I wanted to point something out. Do you mind if I reflect something I noticed? Yeah. Thank you. I actually welcome that now. Um, because I'm, I'm really trying to learn and I find even I can't, none of us are always best seeing our own stuff and it helps to have a mirror. It helps to have someone out there, uh, to bounce things off of. And it also helps to have someone who's not your partner or the romantic interest, or even sometimes your business partner, you know, we can't be everything for everyone. So to find men, to find women, to find other people who, who you aspire to or look up to or feel safe around to, uh, to be of support, to be a place of counsel and communication and to remind you, you know, to take it easy, but to take it is what he got through. He used to say, what else is there to say, Ben? He said it all. Compassion and grace, especially for yourself. I mean, uh, that's been the single greatest gift I've been able to give myself because my addiction was never to alcohol and drugs. My addiction was always to my negative self-talk. Mm. So when I recognized that and I could flip the switch on that, then I could understand that. Yeah. I, I could be compassionate and grateful and kind to myself mm. first, because that opened up the door for me to be able to, to be that way to others. Uh, because I kind of used to be a rough taskmaster, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, you know, I've never taken John Trans yoga class. I've always wanted to. But I really want to get, I, I sense, you know, there's there's definitely some mastery in the house here. And, um, mm. and you know, yet none of us have it figured out. So I just want to say to anyone watching and listening to thank you. And if you do, and I love you, you can say, Aww. and, and I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, please forgive me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you're welcome. You, right. And you're welcome. Like, <laughs> I love you. I'm sorry. I you and you're I'm welcome. sorry. And, and I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love you too. You too, Adam. I love you, brother. I love you too. I love you. Can we do this again? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Please, I, I we vote that we we can we uh, convene in Tulum, mm. and Adam Adam handles some some food, some <laughs> dieta, and we'll line up some shamans, and we do like a big men's initiation. Uh, you know how right that is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Right. Let's create Have it. Have a blessed week. Before namaste. you go, I want to say yes. Namaste. Also, <laughs> I see the light. You too, brother. Uh, if you're listening, please, please, if any of this is resonating, share it, comment, let us know, so that we can feed these positive algorithms of healing and positive change and messages out there. Especially if you're a woman, or you know, you have a man in your life that could use this. Also, don't be afraid to ask for help. And even if you are. I, you know, I give you permission today. We all do. Um, I posted the suicide hotline in the chat. There's three humans here who would love to talk to you. Um, and, uh, you know, Adam's got some really beautiful work to offer inside of his, his podcast and his, his community and his books. John's got a lot inside of his communities and this healing and yoga that he's offering and, and myself here too, inside of my men's team, the lion's den, I'm going to be launching soon. And, um, and just the work that we're going to continue to offer in this dialogue. So please, please come back. And, um, just want to say we love you and we see you and thank you for listening today.
Mm. Namaste. Namaste. Have a beautiful day. Peace.